Hello, Backward Compatible listeners. I'm Chris Kruger, and I'm joined tonight by Adam Doc Bracken. Hey, everybody. And uh, we are going to do a bit of a post-mortem for season one of Roll With It, um, a little series titled The Eden Program. Um, this was a five-episode scenario that we uh, worked together, um, sort of come up with the concept, and a very sort of loose skeleton of what we wanted each episode to be, um, with it being our first episode of Roll With It. Um, we, we, we started the show with the intention of it being um, fairly improvisational. Um, we want it to be something where we have an improvised and an emergent narrative, um, because that's kind of the strength of role-playing games. I think we've um, discussed at length both both on and off the air. For sure. Um, but because it was our first season, we wanted to have a little bit more um, pre-planning kind of going into it because um, we wanted to make sure that we could hit one, our target time um, for each episode. We wanted the episodes to be about 30, 40 minutes. Um, and we wanted to try to wrap it in about five episodes, five episode arc. Which we did a really good job of. Yeah, I think we did. Respect. Um, and so we wanted to sort of go over with you, though, the sort of behind the scenes. Um, we actually recorded a little bit of ourselves um, creating the scenario. Uh, we also recorded ourselves talking between sessions about what had happened and what we intended to do the next session. Um, but more than anything, what we're going to be discussing, I think, is the ways in which um, our pre-planning uh, sort of went to the wayside <laughs> yeah. in, in certain ways. Um, but, you know, a lot of stuff did sort of come through, especially the details of the setting, which I think was you know a good thing that we sort of came up with that. Mm-hmm. Um, a little bit of prep work to come up with the world and stuff is never a bad thing in RPGs, even if you intend to be um, more improvisational. It's true. Um, and as open as possible. Uh, but we just wanted to share some insights about um, sort of our process and how things went as we were recording and uh, maybe even a little bit about the, uh, the post work that I did to deliver the final product um, and to sort of give you some uh, a behind the scenes look at the Eden program. So we really hope you enjoy this as much as we did making it. Big spoiler uh, warning though. If you have not already listened to the Eden program... Yeah, we're going we're to be tearing apart the plot. So. First of all, what's wrong with you? It's awesome. Go listen to it. And second of all, you have been warned. So without further ado, um, this was done uh, a few weeks before mm-hmm. the recording of the actual Eden program. This was done between the two of us because we produced it and wrote it, co-wrote it. Yep. Um, and the players had no idea... What was coming at them? Yeah, I mean, we, literally, they, they came into it blind, entirely blind. Um, and actually, we took that into account uh, as I, I believe is mentioned in the clip. Um, the fact that they're coming into it blind, we actually designed around that. So. Yeah, we did. We did. In fact, they they had nothing on their character sheets but like mm-hmm. their names. Yep. Which was great because of the system we used, which is prime time. So. Indeed. Uh, let's play that clip. Sounds good. All right. So the idea is a kind of a. Prometheus Unbound, um, Ghost in the Shell, Mm -hmm. slash Frankenstein's Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Monster-inspired sci-fi. Now, do you want to recap sort of how we came to this idea, the original idea that you had? I'm not sure I can. Mm -hmm. Um, Clones. Mm -hmm. um, I started with Eden's Log, the idea of Eden's Log, Mm -hmm. and you threw in the idea of a newborn AI. Mm -hmm. And then we combined those two ideas, we mashed them up. Right, right. And Eden's Log is a a film, a not very good film, where this guy wakes up, he has no memories, and he's got to figure out why he's there. It turns out he's the commander who um, had three mission objectives, and by the time he gets to the surface and remembers who he is and watches a recording of himself, uh, sort of uh, total recall style, mm-hmm. um, he's done the three objectives, mm-hmm. and in the end realizes that he was a bad person who killed all these people. So, mm-hmm. uh, but... What we're doing is that the three players, hopefully three players, Mm -hmm. will um, wake up having been born Mm -hmm. as new clones Mm -hmm. with no no character sheets at all. They'll have screen presence, but that's Mm -hmm. it. Yeah, and um, maybe names. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we should give them names or not. Well, they probably like whoever it was that um, because the idea here is that. in the same way that in the you know, Borderlands they have the new you stations mm-hmm. um, where you know you die and your consciousness is uploaded into a new body that they did just struct for you. Mm-hmm. Um, essentially, it's someone tries to do that. 
and they had what they thought was the correct framework. They managed to clone the body perfectly, and it was just a matter of making the transfer of consciousness from the old body to the new body. Um, but for whatever reason, and you know, kind of the theory that I like is that you know there is a you know sort of the ghost in the shell idea. You know that there's a soul inside this human body. Um, that when that body died, that went away, and so what they have is no transfer of consciousness. But there's still the framework sort of programmed into the brain that the brain would need to function when it's sort of turned on as an adult brain, um, which allows them to think and walk and talk and do whatever else the human needs to be able to do, but the personality didn't get uploaded. So essentially what they have is this blank slate personality, this blank character sheet. Um, and so I imagine, though, that those clients who are going to be getting their consciousnesses transferred would have you know, listed their name, and therefore these new bodies have the same name. Because okay. that's their designation. So instead of being naked, mm-hmm. they could actually be wearing generic jumpsuits. Sure. Um, they'd, they'd all three be wearing matching. Um, what, would, what are those? What are those called? They're like the overall um, flight suits, jumpsuits. Yeah, jumpsuit. Oh, jump, jumpsuit works. Mm-hmm. Um, and their name mm-hmm. would be on it. Oh yeah. There you go. And but only their last names. Mm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh, excuse me, goodness, yes. mm-hmm. <laughs> excuse me. Um, but yeah, like one of the, one of the um, sort of objections I had, and it's not like a strong objection, but the uh, the amnesiac story of the Eden's Log mm-hmm. that, like, you know, basically had the same thing in Knights of the Old Republic and so many other stories where, um, you know, they wake up not remembering who they are and then eventually they find out. I kind of like this better because it's not so reliant on just like, oh, they forgot for some reason. Isn't that convenient? You know, it's... Right, um, they they just don't know. And what don't would be fun is for them to come to discover how it is they came to be, yeah, and realize that they're not amnesiacs, mm-hmm. and yeah. that's part of the discovery process exactly. around episode three or so. Yeah, episode three or four. Yeah, for them to figure that out. Mm-hmm. So, um, but then of course the next question that we need to address is um, because Primetime Adventures is built as a sort of story game, mm-hmm. um, its mechanics revolve around story structures, which involves, um, you know, each scene, there's a conflict that is being resolved. And so we need to figure out, because the game's going to be revolving around conflict, what is the nature of the conflict that these characters are going to be running into. Now, it it could be, if we wanted to, because, you know, there are stories that can do this, very um, sort of open-ended as far as the conflict could be, you know, um, man versus self, very internal, um, that sort of thing. But I think... That is way too internalized for mm-hmm. what we're going for. We're going for thirty-minute episodes, five-episode season of uh, or six-episode season. Sorry, yeah, um, of like a cool story that we can get across very quickly oh, without yeah. a ton. No, of there's going to be there's got to be a really cool world here, yeah, or else it won't work. Yep, yep. So, and it's a world where we've people thought they had the technology to make a transfer of consciousness. That's true. There's an arrogance built into mm-hmm. that. There's a hubris. A hubris. Um, now, the easy answer is post-apocalyptic. Um, I want it to, to feel post-apocalyptic mm-hmm. and start out post-apocalyptic mm-hmm. and maybe, as one of those reveals, finish where it's not. Mm-hmm. Um, where they come above the surface. Again, I'm stealing that from Eden's log. Mm-hmm. When they finally reach outside the surface or mm-hmm. outside the dome or outside the whatever... Mm-hmm they realize that there's this whole thriving um, thing up there. And maybe they come across um, the repairman Mm -hmm. or, you know, the repair truck Mm -hmm. that's coming to to fix the broken um, uh, fiber Mm -hmm. that caused the upload to fail Mm -hmm. in the first place. You know what I'm saying? Or, you know, we could also, I mean, maybe we never explained in the show what the failure was because Mm -hmm. I kind of like the idea that everything did go right Mm-hmm. But um, there was just this error, and they didn't understand what you know the quote unquote soul is, and that, like that, that, that can never be transferred. Yeah, that's really good. Um, it's uh, that they never assumed that these three would would stand up and walk out. Mm-hmm. They just were going to let them die down there. After three days, they, their bodies would have died. Mm-hmm. There was no reason to go retrieve them mm-hmm. because there was a um, there was some kind of a catastrophe mm-hmm. um, in this in this pod or in this mm-hmm. unit. It lost power, whatever. It could also be something along the lines of, um, you know, even though there is this hubris and people are interested in this happening, which is why it did, mm-hmm. um, maybe it wasn't 
you know, quite legal yet, or maybe there was some sort of like resistance to the idea, and so maybe there was, say, a government raid, so they did the transfer, and they thought it failed, but then there's a raid, like, you know, later that day or the next day or something mm-hmm. like that, where the building's emptied out, no one's there because the whole thing got shut down, and either they just never found these or they just haven't come back for them yet or something like that, mm-hmm. but then they wake up in this abandoned, you know, office building, laboratory, whatever, um, in the middle of a, you know, thriving society that might be slightly yeah. more dystopian than ours, but, like, you know, near future. Yeah, yeah. Um, And that is, um, you know, once they get outside the building, effectively... Um, which, you know, it could be, like, sort of, like, you know, high security because it's all mm-hmm. sort of top-secret research. Um, but they step outside, and it's, you know, essentially our world. Just, you know... What episode do you think that would happen? Uh, um, that's a really good question, because I think what we're looking at is, um, if we're going with the six-season structure, um, or six-episode six episodes, season, yeah. um, we're thinking pilot episode, um, we're thinking then... One spotlight episode for each of the um, three characters, um, and that would get us through se- episode four. Maybe episode five is the one where they finally breach, essentially. Um, and you know, I, I mentioned that my my newfound my newborn AI idea came from the slot that I had, where um, you know you've got like this AI that's on a spaceship and just in the middle of nowhere, but you've got all these archives of you know human history and mm-hmm. stuff like that, all these records. And so it's this new AI that's sort of going through the stuff and essentially learning what being human is without any context from a human to tell them. Um, We could do a sort of similar idea where these people have access to all this information and they're learning. That would be in the pilot. Yeah, that'd be in the pilot or in like, you know, even the spotlight episodes is they're kind of like learning who they are and what they are. Um, Or it could even be that like that whole thing where they sort of come to these conclusions about what humanity is is first episode, and then they get into the real world episode two, and they're, they've sort of defined their character by then, mm-hmm. and then it's kind of like, where does that lead them in this world? Interesting. Um, so it kind of depends on like how much of an ordeal is it just getting out of the building, how much of the story is about how these essentially blank slates mm-hmm. interact with the world that they've not had like no context in well and we could easily do something like call them runners or skivers or something like that mm-hmm. where um they're within that second episode uh, probably by the third episode the government's on to them or mm-hmm. the, or the company is onto them mm-hmm. and chasing them down and mm-hmm. it becomes a logan's run kind of thing mm-hmm. um if that's the story we want to tell where it's a, mm-hmm. a runaway mm-hmm. but i like the idea of um following sort of a classic go into the underworld, Mm -hmm. get the boon, come back kind of a thing, and Mm -hmm. in the end they have come full circle in realization of who they are. Mm -hmm. Um, And maybe there are... Maybe it would be better to follow the um, Fahrenheit 451 type model, Mm -hmm. where, you know, he... I think his name's Montag. um, He discovers that he doesn't want to burn books anymore, Mm -hmm. and so he becomes a rebel himself Mm -hmm. by the end of it. And goes and lives with a group and becomes a, a book is implied that mm. he's going to learn to become a book. Mm. And since these guys are playing, you know, um, they're, they're blank slates who have, let's say, an increased capacity for learning mm. or something like that, that they could easily... It's like, we didn't just copy your body, we made it better. Right, mm. exactly. Um, that, you know, all, all of them have almost, almost like a superhuman type ability. Mm. And they could choose what, it, what they wanted it to be. As as part of their like one of their aspects, uh-huh. um, so like you know somebody could choose eidetic memory or, mm-hmm. or something like that as they go along, but uh, the idea mm-hmm. being that there's this whole second civilization mm-hmm. of the non because what we're talking about here is post humans. Mm-hmm. We're talking about transcended humans essentially, right, right. Um, which you know a little bit about. <laughs> um, but what if there's a what if there's a civilization out there that is living off the grid and then they have the choice to either join society as a part of the transhuman populations mm-hmm. and, and actually become the new prime human mm-hmm. who gets uploaded in their tra- conscious, in other words, immortality mm-hmm. and become a part of, of the standard civilization mm-hmm. or to go live as part of the Fringers. Mm-hmm. That kind of a, a moral choice, I think, is... That's an interesting thought. You know, super um, compelling I had a thought too and this would mean that maybe you know they don't get get out into the world quite as quickly but 
maybe defining their character. They sort of define their character in a way, um, like each person sort of finalizes who they are in a sense Mm -hmm. in their spotlight episode, Mm -hmm. which could be a good reason to have a spotlight episode for each one. Um, but maybe what, what they come across is, um, essentially like a simulation, almost, um, MGS2 style where they're not aware it's a simulation. I guess you could almost say it's the Matrix, but I'm thinking more MGS2 mm-hmm. than Matrix, um, where basically they're sort of put through this ringer, and that's how they kind of like are learning about at least one view of humanity, um, and they're sort of being given all this information, fed all this information, making judgments about it. Um, their character is defined through this stuff because as far as they're concerned, it's, it's real life. But then they get into the real world, and then you know maybe things are different than what they were shown, or maybe... Um, you know, they were put in more extreme situations in the simulation or, like, you know, very specifically, like, experimental sort of scenarios where they're trying to see, um... Well, no, then, because that, that wouldn't really make sense. That would be, like, if they're... If they're just testing out, like, the new breed of human, whereas what they're trying to do is just transfer consciousness, and they wouldn't be doing that. Yeah. So that doesn't make much sense, actually, now that I think about it. If we're, if we're going on the idea that it's just a thing they were convinced was going to work and it didn't... And now you've got these blank slates that are um, just kind of stuck in this world, you know. All right, so that's that. Uh, Doc, your initial thoughts? Um, That we shouldn't eat and text while we're recording these (laughs) things in case we might actually decide to put them up later. Well, the uh, the full-length version was, like, what, two hours or something like that? Yeah, actually it was. I think that included at least one or two breaks to go um, give you in a bottle or something like that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I went to the uh, bathroom at some point in there, so we'll we'll spare you that. But That was definitely um, a real-time, real-life recording, so, uh, yeah. I, I really like going back and listening to our process because it's mm. so fluid and, and we built on each other's thoughts so much. It's yeah. one of the true joys of designing with you. Mm. Um, Likewise. But one one of the things that um, stuck out to me was the uh, the Joseph Campbell aspect. I, I don't know that I even actually said mm. Joseph Campbell, but that's mm. what I was referring to. Right. Whenever I said... Not um, a myth, hero's journey. Yeah. yeah. Um, going, getting the boon, going into, you know, the, 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 the dark world, if you will. And that's what we ended up doing. That's exactly what we ended up doing with this season mm. was the, um, the boon was information. And it was uh, thematically exactly what we had been talking about, which mm-hmm. was um, the true nature of humanity. Mm-hmm. You know, what what is a soul? Mm-hmm. Kind of uh, the idea. And so, um, you know, when I when I was in uh, Oxford in 2013 at the at the transhuman conference there, mm-hmm. we talked about a lot of these ideas, and I think that that probably informed some of my decision making and, mm-hmm. and my writing and, and that sort of a thing. And I had the pleasure to edit that Mm -hmm. volume as well. And so uh, I, of course, had to read them all (laughs) because that's the way it works. Mm -hmm. And And this is uh, the Transhuman... uh, Yeah, it was a Transhuman conference um, in in 2013 in Oxford. Mm -hmm. Um, But I I think what what all of that came down to was um, this really great and, and... sort of popular idea we've, we've seen it in axiom verge we've seen it in uh, other um what was the example that that you used in uh, um first person shooter uh borderlands right yeah. of course borderlands um that you know whenever we break down the elements of, of a person, do mm. we also break down the soul? Mm. Is that transported along with us? Yeah. You know, whenever we were reborn, that kind of a thing. And that's, well, yeah, that's actually a, a note I made too, is that um, when you're writing science fiction and stuff like that, you kind of need to make certain assumptions about the world because obviously in real life, there are a lot of things that um, we accept as being questions. You know, like we, they're, as much as we think we know, there's a lot more that we don't know. You know? Right. Um, even things that we think we understand, essentially, kind of from a scientific perspective, the sort of philo- philosophical significance of that mm-hmm. um, is still very much open to interpretation. And so, um, you know, I, I wrote down, for instance, the uh, the idea of the ghost in the shell. We, at least from the GM's perspective um, and the producer's perspective, we sort of assumed that we're going to go with the ghost in the shell idea, that a soul is kind of its own entity, in a sense. Um, and that it inhabits a body in much the same way that, like, you or I might um, drive a vehicle. You know, the vehicle is not us, but as long as we're in charge of it, it's an extension of ourselves. Yeah. If that makes sense. We get out and we get into another vehicle, we're mm-hmm. still us. Yes. Um, but then, of course, you know, 
in real life, there's the question of like, you know, it, it, the ghost in the shell is an actual concept, but we don't know that that is um, what consciousness or sentience is. You know, um, there's kind of the uh, very naturalistic view of um, we are purely just biomechanical systems um, and even our thoughts are essentially dictated by um, prior experience and by chemical reactions in our mind in response to stimulus, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, that like we are purely, um, in a sense, we don't even have free will because everything that happens is ultimately a natural process that was set in motion billions of years ago. Right. Um, on the other end, you have the more um, uh, supernaturalist perspective of, you know, there is such a thing as a soul and that sort of thing. Um, so I think effectively we decided to run with the idea that um you know without getting into the idea of like is there a spiritual realm outside of our existence Mm -hmm. that there is such a thing as a soul within our existence Mm -hmm. however we didn't state that assumption anywhere in the the story Um, some of the characters did mm -hmm. Uh, i mean they they questioned it right even 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 um, the inventor himself yeah you know stevens Mm -hmm. he He says if i'm right right yeah and and he made the assertion at the end but we don't really know Mm -hmm. we don't really know and And i think of course uh jim actually in character um with um with job um asked it's like well if they look the same and they behave the same you know are they not souls yeah that's sort of thing and so it's like there were some really interesting things that came up in that regard you know that that reminds me that one of the most difficult things in this process to me at least, was we didn't really start with character. Mm. Um, we were world building within what we saw as a, as a conflict. But you, from, from that clip, you can see that the conflict evolved. Mm-hmm. It became oh. something almost completely different from where we started. Yeah. And yet the world that we ended up building and the, the characters that ended up emerging from that came out of just a simple mechanic of screen presence mm-hmm. combined with names, yep. very telling names. Mm-hmm. Which is, of course, derived from the primetime adventure system, right? Where you, um, by default, they recommend either having a five episode or a nine episode season, um, and each season is made up of um, episodes, and each episode is one session. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, what we did is we actually sat down and we recorded this in the afternoon. We but did. we went into it saying, "Okay, we're recording episode one now. That's the end of episode one. We're recording episode two now, et cetera. That's right. Um, so instead of spreading it out over several weeks, we just did it all at once. And not only that, but it gave us the producers an opportunity between episodes to literally step out of the room mm-hmm. and confab about mm-hmm. what was happening mm-hmm. between the episodes and the great thing is we recorded that too so yeah. we have that to we'll, share we'll be getting to that here shortly which is funny because we actually did this um again before uh i saw any of titan's grave but you know we've been talking a lot about titan's grave recently we have, yeah and they did a similar thing too where um will wheaton who was the gm they basically sat down i think they did it over the course of several days um, but they would basically play like you know three or four sessions a day, right? Um, and then have like fifteen minute breaks between these three hour sessions, um, during which they need to figure out like for a GM who sort of is very traditionalist, which um, well um, Wheaton strikes me more as a traditional GM in the sense that he likes to take that week to plan what's going to happen and to put stuff into it. Basically, a lot of that stuff was handled by his son uh, Ryan, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, who was paying attention as the games were happening, writing down notes about the characters and the players and about what's happening, and then essentially coming to Will in that 15-minute break and saying, okay, here's what we need to do next episode. And you filled that role for me. Um, There were a lot of things, as we'll we'll see with these clips that are coming up, Mm -hmm. um, the story wouldn't have gone the direction that it went if you hadn't been there doing that, Mm -hmm. and we had made those decisions together Mm -hmm. in between episodes. Right. Um, So, yeah, I I think... um, it's interesting to see how it evolved from this idea of a of a failed technology mm-hmm. and and going from the original inspiration of oh yeah it was, it was it was an experimental technology right it was a society that was debating within itself whether it should do this right and it turned into a society that had already accepted it mm-hmm. and now there's this new revelation that might change that and now it became a, sort of a conspiracy theory by mm-hmm. the rebels yeah which is an idea actually that you know I just heard you. Um, throw out there and then it evolved into a major plot point Mm -hmm. um in it so it's really cool uh i guess before we move on the last thing that i would want to mention would be that uh we chose the um spotlight numbers mechanically Mm -hmm. uh very intentionally so that 
everyone would have a two yeah. at the in the first episode yep. and be equal. Mm-hmm. But then we chose a character to have a three and the others have ones mm-hmm. for each of the following three episodes. Mm-hmm. And we the were screen f- presence being a mechanic within um, primetime adventures, where the more screen presence you have, the more the be- basically the better chance you have at succeeding at roles, exactly. And therefore, the more narrative control you have, because what you want for your character is more likely to happen. Yeah, you get literally get more cards because mm-hmm. um, we were playing with with that mechanic. So what ended up happening was there was a spotlight episode for each um, character, and you'll hear us talk about that in mm-hmm. the interludes. As coming up, this is so and so's spotlight episode, so mm-hmm. um, we need to make sure that he gets X, uh, which was kind of interesting. So, um, I, honestly, I think we're uh, I think we ought to move right on into those clips. Yeah, I think so. Let's do it. Let's do that. All right. So uh, end of episode one. Yeah. Um, or, or, producer confab number one. Sorry, meta. So, <laughs> all right. So producer that was the confab executive producer one. right there. We just got yeah. our funding cut. There you go. Uh, <laughs> the rest of the show is going to stink, guys. Um, <laughs> but yeah. So like you said, um, or like we were saying, um, we didn't get the one reveal that we wanted for this episode, which is that they're clones. Mm-hmm. Um, we suspect the one that might have gotten it, but it's not been confirmed. Right. Um, yeah, I think Will's totally on. It, it's going to happen very quickly here. Mm-hmm. Um, even if just the billboards are telling them. So yeah, this is exactly. what the data program is. Well, the next the next episode is Black's episode, and he's mm-hmm. the rock star. So, okay, cool, cool. Um, they're going to totally recognize him and be like, "Oh, wow! I didn't think you were saved," and, mm-hmm. and have that religious conversation. Ah, uh, nice. you know, because it's it's computer saved. It's not actually right, religious right. saved. Uh-huh. It's fun. Um, anything else you think you need to try to work in, or anything? We uh, well, in my notes, um, the this is going to be the beginning of the chase. I, I want the next episode to actually be the proper chase, and we're going to see if we can get that to Mad Max levels okay. or Running Man levels. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want them to be dodging the cops the entire time this, mm-hmm. this episode. If And, and I hope that uh, Jim's going to take the bait on that and actually mm-hmm. you know, try to dodge them. And what I would say, too, is if they, for some reason, decide not to dodge them, we can have the old... Um, dystopian uh, deus ex machina that is someone from the resistance contacts them like some like you know some voice the only they can hear is they're being processed that's perfect it's like hey you guys need to get out I'll tell you how that sort that's of thing. absolutely perfect so if we need to kind sort of, like of neo yeah if we yeah. need to intervene we can do that okay I'll do that so that's a great, great uh, cool cool anything else that's it um, I think that's it for now yeah what's, right. the, what's the big reveal at the end of this one again uh, the big reveal at the end of this one is um, actually I forget I'm gonna have to look at my notes Okay. <laughs> cool. We'll get back to you next time on that. All right. So. All right. So a couple of interesting observations I got from listening back to that, um, and especially in the context again of listening to um, that first little bit of our um, pre-planning, uh, the characters are lost, so to speak, for a lot longer um, than we imagined originally. Uh, we we even said in the pre-planning that within the first episode or two they were going to know who and what they were right and then the rest of the story is going to be about what that means mm-hmm. um they took like really three episodes um to get the big reveal that they are like they, they got they got a lot of hints and they sort of started to figure it out and had suspicions but mm-hmm. they didn't confirm that they were um new ghosts and these clones yeah um until episode three and it translated really well over into the climax mm-hmm. I mean, we were talking before about the five act structure and when we were designing we intentionally just embraced that idea of conflict rising action climax falling action Mm -hmm. and then conflict resolution Mm -hmm. and so we kind of structured it around that idea but um i I think the fact that we talked about needing a deus ex machina Mm -hmm. in other words a uh you know an out (laughs) yeah a way to 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 save the narrative yeah if well especially because behind and this is an interesting um reality of doing improvised stories based on role-playing games because um, even to whatever extent we encouraged people to approach this less like a normal session at a table and more like an improvised drama, right? Um, it still is a role playing game, yeah. And so there's a lot of time that is spent, and we actually cut a lot of this out of people asking questions about like you know a how the rules work, b um, kind of like what's going on and getting clarification. And we include some of that, of yeah. course. The actual drawing um, of the cards, we mm-hmm. cut most of that out. Yeah, but what ends up happening is that what you intend as the GM to happen within a session. If you have unlimited time, no time constraints, you could just go, you know, the extra half hour, an hour it takes in the session to get to that point you intended to end at. Yeah. Um, but here, because we want to end at a time and not at a point, 
um, we would sometimes find that the intended reveal, as we mentioned in the in the confabs, um, end up getting pushed back a bit. That's true. Um, and that definitely happened with one. I think it happened with two and three and and pretty much all of them. <laughs> the uh, like what we intended to be the ending of an episode ended up being kind of like the beginning or middle of the next. Um, yeah, it's so true. Well, and and I think it's worth mentioning that in in a more traditional game, um, you know, we were we were talking about. Um, uh, Titan's Grave earlier, mm-hmm. so it's maybe one we could use an example. I think probably the plot was pretty linear. Um, now, the individual choices that were made, mm-hmm. I think, were very bottlenecked within the context of the metaphorical um, narrative room mm-hmm. you're in at yeah. the moment. Um, so, I think the characters were completely owned by the players. Yes. And I don't mean to, you know, mm. <laughs> to say anything other than that. Right. But. Um, I think that if you think about it in terms of branching narrative, there were probably only one or two choices um, within that narrative at mm-hmm. certain points. I'm thinking of episode nine specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, but for us, with this, with the Eden program, I think there was a lot of ergodic um, storytelling that was really occurring. Mm-hmm. Uh, both you and I were reacting in real time, mm-hmm. and in some cases, me within the context of the narrative mm-hmm. in real, even more real time. Yeah. And we'll get to more specific examples of that. Yeah, as we, we will. Along, yeah. Um, but it it required us to sort of think on our feet and to write on our feet um, right then and there mm-hmm. because we didn't have a specific narrative that we were forcing down the throats yeah. of the players. We didn't have a big reveal that we knew was mm-hmm. happening. We had we had ideas, mm-hmm. but we also were completely willing to accept that they might go totally off the rails yeah. on this. And we did not want to force them back into it. Mm-hmm. We wanted the story to be told as much by the players as by us. Yes, The world was created by us, mm-hmm. but the story was, was literally derived from the actions of the players. Yep. And we wanted that to be reflected. And that's one of the reasons why we chose the system that we chose, because mm-hmm. Primetime Adventures is very, very good at that. And I think moving forward with other seasons, we're definitely going to embrace that even more mm-hmm. even more than we did in this first season. Worth mentioning, too, and uh, this is something that it might have been good to mention um, after we listened to the, uh, the pre-planning, but um, we were at one point referring to something that I did. What we were referring to there was a uh, another campaign we just finished running using Primetime Adventures um, called Avalon. That's right. Um, and it's one that I ran as the GM slash producer. And so I mentioned how, um, you know, I, I had pre-planned like a little bit of kind of like, here's some points I might want to hit. Um, here's some interesting ideas I had. But really, I did go into it pretty blind. Um, and I wanted to embrace Primetime's ability to allow the players to own their characters and determine what their character story was going to be and mm-hmm. then build the rest of the story around that. Um, so I think that that worked out really nicely for us and Eden Program as well. Um, I, yeah, made, I agree. I made a couple little, a couple more little notes here about that, um, and this is something that we'll see more in later episodes. But it was funny because we had these blank slate characters. We gave them empty sheets, and really, they could do whatever they wanted. I think probably the one time in particular that um, they kind of deviated from uh, basically the the their clone, like the people they were clones of, their predecessors, um, is when Will said um, stuff about engineering school. Um, we all know that that was a false memory. Mm-hmm, that yeah. he was uh, a false memory or something that was kind of like uh, I don't know if we mentioned in the um, in the or if we included in the um, little clip we had of the pre planning the idea that um, the AI or the the new bodies were going to be printed so to speak with um, a certain amount of just like basic brain function, right? So that they could live and they could think that sort of thing, um, and then personality could sort of like fit into that. Um, so there might have been enough sort of like um, residual memory, if you will, of mm-hmm. whoever it was that designed that, um, whatever knowledge of engineering um, the characters would need to survive. Essentially, was shall we say amplified for right. will in that case for what it's worth that's an idea that i stole from maze runner mm. which is now a film but was mm-hmm. originally a, a children's book that i read uh, the young adult novel i really should say mm-hmm. i read last year um i enjoy that series quite a bit actually um, but I, I think what i found um kind of interesting about this is that um we ended up like we i think we were prepared to have um maybe 
their predecessors take on some of their characteristics a little bit based on what they had said, mm-hmm. um, just to kind of like let them choose and then maybe base a few things in the NPCs on the PCs. That's right. Instead, they kind of accidentally took on a lot of the qualities of their predecessors on their own. Yeah. <laughs> um, it just kind of was, and I think we, we intentionally chose who would play whom um, as far as yeah, like the did. concept. Based um, on the our play, their play style, because mm-hmm. we know them so well. Um, but we weren't necessarily expecting that they would go so far as to actually just like become the characters that we had yeah. pre-designed well, um, I mean, a lot of it was really fun though whenever we created the names for example yeah um like joe stevens yeah. was an steve obvious yeah. obvious reference to steve jobs yeah um and you know somebody out there in the audience just went oh wow i didn't even catch that <laughs> um, so this one's for you yeah. but um then we had freddie black mm-hmm. which it's like freddie mercury and jack jack black. black um i think actually i had like the idea of uh jack white um from uh the White Stripes. I think that's the name of the band. I'm drawing a blank. Oh, okay. Um, because I was kind of thinking more the uh, the. And I think the term actually came up in the game at one point. A uh, rock artist, right. more so than like a rock star. <laughs> yeah. Um, because they are they're rockers, but they also have a sense of um, aesthetics. You know, exactly. They're, they're all about their art. Um, but we ended up going with black instead of white, and it also worked out that you know Jack Black and that's right. Um, Brian's kind of a silly player in general, so right. And then of course our senator, mm-hmm. um, he was just we, we basically pulled famous presidents. Yeah, James but, Madison and um, uh, Thomas Jefferson. Right, and just did James Jefferson exactly because so. it had that kind of onomatopoeia to it. Or, mm-hmm. Was that assonance? I don't know. I can never keep. Those um, right. it's alliteration. Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah, that's the one. I used to teach English, everyone. <laughs> um. But yeah, um, I say we move on into our uh, third clip then, which is our confab between episode two and episode three. Sounds good. And of course, episode two ends um, in a very precarious position for us as writers Mm -hmm. because... They split the party. They split the party. (laughs) Yeah. Oh my goodness. And they'll hear our reaction to that. (laughs) Yeah. All right, so number two. They have split the party. They split the party. Yeah. Fantastic. (laughs) That is really good. And I think that'll be good too because then we can start seeing... um, it's uh, it's Will's Twilight episode next, yeah, right? It is. So he's the one who's separated. Yeah, he is. So this will be uh, this will work out nicely. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the chase hasn't really begun in earnest. Um, they were sort of like doing like the running thing, but it was more informational than action. Yeah, it was. I think this one might be when we do cut away from Will, more action probably. Yeah, this is meant to be the uh, the chase mm-hmm. episode, so it's kind of cool that he's somewhere else while mm-hmm. these other guys do their chase right with their ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, the nice thing is because of the technology, they'll be able to communicate. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna very quickly tap them into each other so they can continue to to talk. Cool, cool. Um, so that's yeah. the one change that I'm gonna make mm-hmm. from what it had intended. And of course, quickly invent um, something for them to happen. What do you think? In like uh, interrogation or? Uh, um. Yeah, I don't know. I think an interrogation could work. It's kind of a question of how quickly this force moves. Mm -hmm. Um, If it's more kind of like we hold them for a while and then eventually get to them. Uh, I have a feeling that in this society it might actually be they get to them pretty quickly. So maybe a very brief holding period um, during which they might, um, maybe that's the point at which they sort of get in touch with them. Um, But then that that maybe also um, is bad because then they're able to, because he's under their um, network essentially, Mm -hmm. they can then trace where it's coming from. Yeah. Um, so maybe then they know that there's going to be a raid coming at some point to wherever these guys are hiding out. That makes sense. Um, so a big reveal for this episode is what? Well, um, the end of it, they're going to discover the the fringe um, is a sort of civilization. We weren't going to call it the fringe, though. What were we going to call it? Um, they're the conserves. The conserves, yeah, that's and right. And so maybe we can call these settlements like conservations or something like right. that? Right, the con- conservations. I love it. It's fantastic. Cool, cool. Um, so they're going to make it to the, the conserves after the chase. And they're going to ask for the evidence, mm-hmm. um, and and they're not going to have it. They're going to have to go back into the break back into the city mm-hmm. and, and go get um, mm-hmm. go get the the proof that that what mm-hmm. they're saying is true. Mm-hmm. Uh, they didn't actually succeed in in the first episode in playing the video, which mm-hmm. was interesting. I had it ready. I had it written. Oh, nice. Uh, just in case. Uh-huh. But um, so they haven't played that yet, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm thinking maybe they'll. Uh, there's a possibility that since one of them stayed behind he might be able to get back in and actually do that. Or maybe... By um, proxy. I wonder if maybe that could happen, or maybe there's something where uh, security manages to find it, because they didn't pull it. That's a um, great idea. While they were in there, they found it, mm. and as a part of the interrogation, they were going to play it for him and say, what's the meaning of this? Mm. 
And of course he doesn't know. And he doesn't know. Yeah. That's fantastic. And they, of course they don't, because you know, even the concerts are thinking that theory is preposterous. Right. There's no way it could possibly be true. Um, and so uh, they're going to like not even have a concept of um, what just happened. Now remind me what Jefferson's backstory was. He was the politician. Right. He was the uh, basically the candidate for the last election that basically started the ball rolling toward the society that we have now. That's right. That's exactly he was right. Um, the uh, Democratic Republican versus the Federalists. That's right. And the Federalists are now, um, I think what they colloquially call themselves was uh, um, the Pioneers, the Frontiersmen or something like that. Yeah. Because they're all about going into the next frontier. Cool. So, well, let's hit it. I'm, cool. I'm excited. All right. All right. So, um, so one thing, uh, I think the idea was that the chase was going to um, be in the next episode and be really big. Um, and then they were going to get to the conserve near the end. Um, they ended up getting to the conserve, but they didn't actually get the evidence and stuff like that until the next episode, which works. Yeah. Um, but I remember in the first confab, you mentioned that we wanted the chase to be kind of like uh, Mad La- Mad Max or Running Man level, and yeah. it wasn't nearly no, that. No, it wasn't. It was. It, they drove through a desert, got shot at a little bit, drove through a minefield, but nobody was really chasing them. So it was just kind of like they were oh, you followed. Know, I had actually in. seen Fury Road like the week before, <laughs> uh-huh. um, and so it takes about a week for the adrenaline to run off. Uh, you know, like actually run out uh-huh. after you've <laughs> you've seen that movie because mm-hmm. um, it's just so insane. But um, yeah, the, the problem was, and I don't know that it was even a problem, really. Mm. Um, if you think of it in terms of character versus plot mm-hmm. or, or action, um, we had a, a spotlight episode with a character who was, uh, again, split from the party, mm-hmm. and it really became about him. It came, yeah. became about um, Jefferson. Mm-hmm. And Actually, I think that the interrogation scene was one of my favorites. Um, Me too. Because it had a lot of really good improvised dialogue. Yes, it did. It was like probably the best just conversation um, in the series. Well, and exposition wise, yeah. it was a lot more informative than Chase and the Desert was going to be. Definitely, yeah. Um, so instead of um, being shown through words, mm-hmm. well, we were actually told through dialogue and um, delved into the, the, ha- the past and the history and, mm-hmm. of the world and that sort of a thing. So I didn't actually regret that um, slipping away mm-hmm. at all. I, I think that's fine. Um, and what's interesting is, even though we talked about the political background and we knew the political background, it, never it actually came up, yeah. it didn't come up. The but, the fact that he ran for president came up, um, and you know, there's kind of like I think room to ask, like you know, maybe maybe this was an issue at the time, mm-hmm. um, but it's never stated. Yeah, but it was it was foremost on my mind mm-hmm. during that time. Had it had it been appropriate or necessary to say those things I, I could have had it because it was right there right. I think it, it in some ways becomes more compelling because it's just background stuff that doesn't matter anymore mm-hmm. you know, it makes me think of um, uh, the way that Tim Schafer designs his characters um, for Psychonauts for example he had like a Friendster page for mm-hmm. every character oh, yeah. um, it speaks of the timing and the Friendster. <laughs> um, but, but he talks about that in, in a, uh, an old um, GDC mm. um, which is downloadable yeah and and he's he's like he just spent days and days and days on the backgrounds of these characters and it never comes up. Yeah, it's it's actually it's a really important part of writing. And some writers are able to have a good sense of their characters without having to do as lot uh, quite as much sort of like formal prep work, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's important for a lot of writers in their process to really understand like enough information to put into like. 20 of the book they're writing yeah no kidding. um in order to make sure that like they know enough of what they need for the story to work in the one book they're writing um so that's something we kind of did there where we had the background established um and a lot of the details don't really come out but it's still important to know because we need to have known that for the sort of the bleed through if you will of yeah. um sort of like the the hidden meaning, the reading between the lines of things that we say um, when we respond to player questions and are trying to describe the society. Exactly. And so it was interesting that I had to know the characters, um, the, the, the NPC versions, the dead versions, yeah. if you will, yeah. of these characters even more than the characters knew themselves mm-hmm. um, as they were playing because they were no longer them. Yeah. And so it worked. Yeah. The, the changes. And of course, I took my cues partly from from them Mm -hmm. um and went ahead and just echoed some of their core personality to bring up that question of Mm -hmm. hmm are they a different person can you change your personality whenever you're cloned yeah and the fact that they again were naturally so close to kind of what we conceptualized and the fact that you did base that a little bit on them i think really does you know bring up that question you know they they weren't 
totally different people, so to speak, even though they were. Yeah, exactly. Um, which is interesting. Um, let's see here. Yeah, I, it was interesting. We mentioned the trace of uh, if, when they get contacted, they could trace them back. We never stated that anywhere in the series, but you know the uh, the, the the super fan who was really wondering about like, well, how did they find the conserve if they didn't just like directly follow the truck during the chase? Um, you know, that's one possible explanation that someone might have come up with. But again, we never said it. So, sure, yeah. Uh, well, there you go, guys. That might have been... Uh, I don't know. Were you thinking that? Were you thinking that they did trace them back? Yeah, I mean, the, the truck had, uh, like, GPS and stuff on mm-hmm. it. And they were so, using all kinds of crazy technology. Yeah, one so. way or another, they would have been able to trace them yeah. back. So. And, and, of course, you think about it. The the attack, the invasion, was a mm-hmm. bunch of old people mm-hmm. living in a canyon. Yeah. And there's basically, that we know of, one guy with a bunch of drones who mm-hmm. shows up in one van. Mm-hmm. So... <laughs> That we know of. That we know of. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't terribly awful. But mm-hmm. you know, you're talking about a world that having an army would, wouldn't make sense anyway because yeah. there's so few people. Mm-hmm. Um, we we actually encounter very very few people the entire time, mm-hmm. and that's because most of them have already been uploaded and are just waiting for the world to either heal itself mm-hmm. or for them to be copied out into space yeah. or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. So. Um, it really only would have taken a guy with superior technology to just run out there and, and run the, the remotes. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, it's also interesting that we, um, in much the same way that we planned for the uh, Deus Ex Machina, if we needed it in uh, episode two. And boy, did we need it. Um, we also found a way here to um, show them the video they missed in episode one. That's right. Um, so that was interesting. There. That was the only thing I wrote out in advance. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I had I had some minor notes. Like, and I think um, it's an appropriate thing to write out in advance because it would have been recorded. Right. Regardless of whatever the players do, whatever, wherever they go with the story, it is a thing that happened definitively. Honestly, though, it had less to do with that and more to do with I've been trapped as a GM before with people um, with making something up on the spot because mm-hmm. it was cool and then people it's saying, like oh what did the video say yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah let's play that back and then you you can't you can't play it back word for word right but in this case I could and there was a time later when I actually did read it again mm-hmm. um, and in post I actually I just took the original recording yeah you so did. it sound the same <laughs> of course um, but yeah you did read it back and you read it back in full which is why in post I did keep the whole recording right exactly um, in there so yeah so, um, well, let's move on then. Um, this is going to be our confab, our third confab, between episode three and four. Right. Okay. So, I decided not to end that one on you have to go back. Mm-hmm. We're going to do that at the beginning with them sitting in there taking the tests and asking for the info. Right. Um, and that'll be the hook. And then they'll decide whether or not they need to do it. What's interesting is because Will's character is actually in the city, mm-hmm. they may not need to go back. Mm-hmm. They might they, just need to walk him through doing it. Yeah. Mm. Uh, which would be interesting in and of itself. And then they can explore that concert of civilization a little bit and mm. see what it's like. Um, in, uh, this is the heist episode. Mm-hmm. And so basically, in one way or another, they, they need to get the information um, broadcast mm-hmm. now that Will has that information literally in front of him. I mm-hmm. mean, he saw the video. Mm-hmm. The rest of the city needs to see that mm-hmm. info. Well, again, though, he didn't see the telling part. No, he didn't. Um, he sort of suggested that it doesn't work, but they don't really know how it doesn't work. Right. Well, and they, they, it, supposedly there was, um, you know, all the information that you need is here, mm-hmm. the images that follow this broadcast. Right, right. So, and so they need to see that. Assume, but, assuming that the cops have that, mm-hmm. which they should, or secur- security has that, yeah. as they should, he, he might be able to steal it from them, mm-hmm. or he might be able to, to go back and get it from the original computer. I would imagine, too, that um, at this point, if they get it, they have a duplicate. Because the cops aren't going to have just like the single file. You right. know, they're going to have backups upon backups oh, yeah, of absolutely. everything they get in this sort of technology age. So um, at this point, we know full well the cops do have that info. And whatever they get, they're going to have just the second copy of it. Mm-hmm. Which would be interesting because then the cops could potentially, as part of the propaganda machine, like hand it off to someone and they doctor it to make it look like something it wasn't. Sure, yeah. And so then there are now two versions of this video floating around on the web. And nobody knows which one's the real one. I like it. Um, oh, that's a great twist. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that can also play into that, like uh, that sort of choice at the end of yeah. which side do you go with, um, and then sort of like which one do you try to prove or disprove nice. or whatever that case might be. Um, doop, 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 doop. Uh, Any other twists? I'm trying to think. There was something in my head a second ago, but I'm drawing a blank on it. But no. Um, how can we get 
because um, this is actually not Will's focus episode. Mm-hmm. This is actually meant to be Jim's, mm-hmm. and he's the—I mean, he's the head of the corporation, and mm-hmm. that needs to be revealed. Mm-hmm. So, um, something uh, just how, how can we get him involved? Something's an aside, and that this kind of ties into that. Mm-hmm. Um, he, uh, what's funny is. Um, Sometimes they've been seeming to take edges that kind of fit what we've been telling them about themselves. Yeah, that's true. Which is interesting. Um, and informed by the name as well. Yeah, which informed we by helped. the name. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's intriguing. Like, we ought to be sure, at least from our end, that it doesn't, they don't need it all to match up. In fact, it might be really good to have things more and more that suggest that they're, they are nothing like them old, they're also, uh, their old selves. Yeah, that's true. Um, so basically, however they're acting, essentially the opposite or something distinctly different mm-hmm. about them um, comes out. Um, it might be interesting, too, is even in the conserve, if they aren't convinced that um, what Job was saying actually happened, if they just think there's, like, something weird going on, you know? What do you so, mean? Like, so they see them, and they see that they're not the same as they were. Yeah. Maybe they're still skeptical. Maybe they think that these are just, like, imposters. Like, they're, they're not buying into it. There might be still even, um, what's his name? Uh, the guy who's been talking to them the whole time. Um, oh, Philemon. Philemon, yeah. Um, Philemon. Philemon. Um, he, uh, he was, he's even saying that this is impossible and he's waiting to see the scan. So I can imagine there might be a lot of people who don't want to accept it. Right. So that could be a plot point. But as far as how we get Jim involved... Um, well, I was thinking, what if they have the scanner ability mm-hmm. to actually upload them, broadcast them back to the city, and reprint them? Now that the facility is operational again, mm. you know what I'm saying. So if they if they've hacked into the Alpha site, mm-hmm. they could literally teleport them using oh upload the tech, themselves upload them themselves mm. to the. But then how? You see, that's interesting though because um, part of the plot is that we're actually killing the current consciousness. I know, um, but they're copying. Mm-hmm. They're copying themselves and doing it. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it, but, it but work. I, I feel they retain like, their memories. As I, I feel like we need to have that reveal and have them fully understand the gravity of it before we ask them to do something like I that. I agree. And then basically, these characters, even though they're going to keep playing as themselves, okay, so I'll be sure to have file file them. But, but they need to understand that if they do that, they're suiciding. Perfect. And that there's another copy of them that's going to do their thing. Perfect. I love it. Um, so there's that. But the other thing that could happen to get Jim involved. Um, is because he's been kind of taking these hackering thing, hacker-ish things. Yeah. Um, he could possibly be like basically taking over what Philemon's been doing and helping Will get through the facilities and stuff like that um, with kind of like his long-distance hackery. You know. How about the um, the concert gets attacked mm. by um, flying security forces? Oh yeah, because and, they, they and stopped Phi- at the gate, but they, just, they come back with and reinforcements. And Philemon literally gets gets killed. He gets taken out. Nice. Nice. Um, that'll force them to, mm. to take the lead. I'll mm-hmm. do it. That's what- wow. <laughs> I think the thing that stands out most for me was that the attack, which became such a, a big scene, mm-hmm. so pivotal, um, was actually just improv mm-hmm. and almost an afterthought yeah. in that confab. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the, 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 the character that was created out of that attack and, and all the other things that happened... Mm-hmm. Um, the moral decisions that were then thrust upon them. Yeah. Um, it was interesting that they... I, I forget if in the episode Use the GM kind of suggested sending them back or mm-hmm. like, you know, obviously would have been through a character um, or if it was one of them who had the thought of sending themselves back. Oh, yeah. Brian, that is uh, Freddie Black, mm-hmm. almost did it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he was actually in the chair and he had the hat on his head mm-hmm. and, and he was like... And, that, and that's where we got that really fantastic line, which uh, was you. you are, you, are you willing to kill two people just to save a couple hours drive? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was um, just like so my favorite line. It, it worked perfectly show. though because like one, they had the idea, and two, they had the same objections that we mentioned there. Yeah, which is that they have to realize that they're suiciding if they do that. That's right. Um, and actually, that um, brought up um, it was something I think I mentioned during our uh, our, our pre planning chat. Um, that obviously was not played here, but um, there is a, a quote from Borderlands 2 that it just struck to machine, um, the, the respawn machine, that um, whenever you die in the game, it respawns you because it basically transfers your consciousness and it destructs you, uh-huh. um, which I've heard is non canon, but it's kind of like one of those things that it's sort of an inside joke um, at Gearbox that, like, 
it's I think it's officially non-canon, but they sort of make fun of people asking whether or not it's canon. Well, it's or kind like of a Star Trek reference, really. Yeah. I mean, that's the reason why Bones never wanted to use the yeah, thing. because it's like if you get dematerialized and then rematerialized, are you still you? Yeah. Um, but one of the things I love is uh, one of the times you respawn the Hyperion New EU station says um, Hyperion suggests that you do not think about the fact that this is only a digital reconstruction of your original body, which died the first time you respawned. Do not think about this. <laughs> Which is, like, totally the thing that would have happened if, like, they kept playing as their characters. Like, so wait, am I still me? Or, you know, yeah. but... Anyway. Chris, we all know that that's uh, taken care of through the Heisenberg Compensator. Mm. Um, Google it. And, yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, uh, it was also interesting, too, the, uh, the idea that I had about... Um, and we'll get more into this um, after we review the, um, the final confab and the sort of decision-making process behind this. Mm -hmm. Um, But when I suggested that we show their old selves being distinctly different from their new selves to emphasize that difference, um, it was interesting that that came through the most with um, old Job, or Job Prime, if you will, um, where he was not of the same mindset as, um, we'll say, uh, Job uh, Beta, Right. <laughs> um, they came before Jim. That's right. Um, that, like, basically it was a clone of the original Job who didn't agree with the original Job. And mm-hmm. so kind of, like, through the, the Job trilogy, if you will, you can see how um, even a mostly same being, um, even one that was a just direct clone, a direct copy, and not um, uh, just, like, a, a physical clone. Right. It, this, the tr- consciousness was transferred. Even the same consciousness being transferred to make a different decision than the original consciousness. I attribute that to copy errors. When you make a copy of a copy on a fax machine, or, <laughs> you know, on a, on a Xerox machine, mm. uh, they're, Play- they're errors. <laughs> yeah. yeah so. But playing the telephone game with your mind. That's right. So. That's exactly right. Transhumanism is a bad idea, guys. <laughs> I kid. Uh, That's a great idea. Well, it, um, the audience may find it interesting that the inspiration for this particular episode um, was actually the Serenity movie. Mm. Uh, the, the whole heist idea, which got shifted just a little bit by, by one episode plot-wise, mm-hmm. um, was based entirely around the idea of um, we have found out where the um, space zombies come from mm-hmm. and we're going to uh, break into the big satellite transmission thing and we're going to broadcast that to the whole verse. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what we were asking them to do, except it was not a, a broadcast. It was a, an internal um, broadcast, right. if you will, uh, to the to the minds that were uploaded mm-hmm. in the big computer, mm-hmm. the, the four-story, five-story computer. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but, but it's the same principle. It, it was, we now have information. Are, are we going to share it? Yeah. My, my guiding philosophy on, on this whole series was... Um, if I didn't know what to do in a particular point, I needed to provide them with a moral choice. Mm-hmm. Because the morality of all of this is what it really came down to. We, we spoke of the final choice, the mm-hmm. final decision that they were going to have to make, which was to support or deny mm-hmm. this um, choice that civilization had made. Right. And I wanted all the little things to add up to that and and give them something to stand mm-hmm. on. It's also interesting, too. You saw a little bit of um, sort of... Uh, how do I put this? It, it's a it's a concept that in Bioshock they played with to great effect. The famous um, uh, "Would you kindly" moment, oh, which right. is the idea that when a player is sort of say, "Okay, here's your character, and here is your quest, and you're going to go do it because it's your quest." Basically, yeah. these guys, because essentially they are running from the society from the beginning, um, I think their instinct was naturally that, like, "Oh, look, we're on the outside looking in. We're the rebels. Therefore, we need to." Um, spread this news and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So they just kind of assumed that that was the mission that they needed to find this information and then broadcast to everyone, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then interestingly, in the end, um, that got shifted quite a bit. It did. Um, it so, sure did. Uh, it is interesting, though, to kind of study the um, sort of the player psychology. And like this group is not one that necessarily just kind of like goes along with the narrative of a game and doesn't pay attention. You know, they're the oh, ones no. that, like, if anyone's going to ask questions about what they're doing and why, it's going to be this group. Yeah. Um, and yet they <laughs> oh, still yeah. they still fell, you know, prey to that. They did. Uh, which is interesting, so. We need to print up some t-shirts and, and sell them online that, that say something like, um, roll with it, we break games. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, 
I want to I want to talk about the last episode, but I think before we do that, we need to play the last confab. Agreed. <laughs> All right. So uh, that was episode four. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that went pretty well. Yeah. Um, big reveal, big climax, big mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm. I'm going to start by telling them uh, by having security tell them that they were able to. Um, cut the building off from the rest of the world mm. and so um, they're going to have to get out if they want to broadcast anywhere well basically the um, this computer system is now corrupt mm. and, and the minds within it the saved minds within it mm. now have the knowledge and there's nothing they can do about that mm-hmm. but um, they're probably going to be um, this is the part where they make the big deal mm-hmm. and so one of the one of the terms of the deal is um, we're going to purge this computer system mm-hmm. we're going to lose the the um, Let's call it a let's call it a billion minds that's in this system, but uh, at least the rest of the world will be safe from the the terrible mm. uh, knowledge that you mm. have um, come upon. So a thought the world actually, can't know mm-hmm. what you've just done. Mm-hmm. Um, a thought I was going to mention too is that the minds that are copied. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, we've already kind of established that there was this reaction. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be, though, that the minds that are copied actually aren't sentient. It's literally just data, and yeah. it doesn't become sentient until it's in an actual brain again. It's frozen. Mm-hmm. It's frozen in place. Yeah, mm-hmm. there we go. Um, so if the minds woke up, they would still have the data there, essentially. Yeah. And they'd be like, oh, crap. But like those minds that are asleep, so to speak. Yeah, there we go. Aren't. So what, what's the term for whenever you have a virus? A virus vault? Mm. Um, so we're gonna have to we're gonna have a to quarantine. Yeah, we're gonna have to quarantine this data mm-hmm. um, until we can figure out how to purge the knowledge that you've uh, the virus that you've inflicted into it. Right, right. Uh, the knowledge virus mm-hmm. um, and the knowledge worm, mm-hmm. or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, basically, the, the the choice that they're supposed to have to make at this point is: do they want to reintegrate with society? Mm. They're going to give them that option. Mm-hmm. Um, we we now know and we understand that you are souls. Mm-hmm. You're real. Um, oh, so they're going to be showing some uh, very quick compassion. It's not just instantly like right. that's like, oh, you guys are souls. We know she that now. She is, or she is. Okay. She's been watching them, mm. and she is the personification of the, all the good things about this society. Okay, cool, cool. Because um, it's it is still technically a utopia, mm-hmm. um, and Jim brought up the point, and I'm going to reinforce this. Mm-hmm. Who's to say that just because that the soul is destroyed? Yeah, yeah. Or that there's just not another one now that's effectively like you got rid of one but now there's another one that you've copied onto it right you know it's a second it looks like the first soul but it's a second soul it's actually a third that over at the second but, right yeah you know so, what what is what is a soul yeah i mean if you are this man you may not have his memories and knowledge mm-hmm. but maybe you still are his soul mm-hmm. you know kind of idea yeah yeah that's the propaganda anyway mm-hmm. and so it's going to come back to don't believe the propaganda mm-hmm. And, and basically, they're going to have to decide, you know, are, are they going to do what they did before when they were old men mm-hmm. and, you know, start back up the, re- the rebellion? Mm-hmm. Um, or, because they themselves are, are fresh mm-hmm. fresh humans, yeah, yeah. Un, 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 uncopied mm-hmm. individuals, mm-hmm. Um, or are they going to allow themselves to be copied in the future? Mm-hmm and become immortal Mm -hmm. and a part of the civilization, integrate with the civilization. Mm -hmm. Cool. It'd be actually an interesting thought, too, if maybe uh, um, they are offered, or maybe somehow hinted at, I don't know if they'd be offered directly, um, but uh, getting a fresh new body that just basically is like random genetics. Mm -hmm. So it produces a human, but it's not based on you know, a copy of this person's genetics, or it's not like, you know, two parents mixing their genes. It's just kind of like a generated human. And so they generate a new body for them so they can actually be their own person um, instead of being a new soul in someone else's body. I love it. So it, it's, it's the Cain project, as in Cain and Abel. Oh. The Cain, oh. The Cain initiative? Ew. Because <laughs> yeah. Cain killed Abel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's the idea of, of, of the genetics mixing mm-hmm. to produce a new generation of individuals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Because um, they were working on that right up at the point where the old man left, mm-hmm. where where he mm-hmm. took off and became mm-hmm. a terrorist traitor. Um, for our own reference, too, we kind of need to establish, again, um, just for clarity's sake, the uh, the sort of, like, the sides so, of course, we've got the frontiersmen, the new society, the transhumans. Mm-hmm. They're all about, you know, advancing humanity, essentially becoming immortal, quote-unquote. Right. Um, it might not be a bad idea, too, to, like, 
reinforce again the religious overtones. Yeah, I agree. Um, especially if we start to see like you know maybe advertisements, propaganda, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's like since you guys are new, we're going to be a crash course essentially on what we're all about. Um, maybe not worded that way, um, but it's got this very sort of um, uh, transcendent feel to it. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas the other side. Um, because like transhumanism isn't inherently bad right you know um, so the other side like what's their argument because before now they didn't know that it was murder and now this is the strongest point they have mm-hmm. uh, but before they need to have had a reason which I think is basically just like we shouldn't be playing God um, which is a valid point of view as well yep. um, so basically they're just kind of the the um, I guess the top of the brakes party so to speak <laughs> who is? Uh, the concerts Got it. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so their argument just always been what we're doing here is territory that we shouldn't be doing. And now basically this is a kind of I told you so. They haven't had an I told you to- so until now. That's true. Um, so yeah. I love it. Cool. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. So I think probably the most obvious question is who was she? Mm. Because that's not what happened in the final episode. Yeah, no. There well, was no she. Now, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that she was Catsuit Lady. That's right. Um, she actually did have a name. Mm. Um, it's a name we've said on the podcast before, which is kind of funny. Mm. Um, Vixen Fox is an uh. internal reference to a very old and very stupid cartoon that mm. I did one time, uh-huh. uh, which will remain nameless. But... Uh, the the reason why it's been used as sort of the default NPC um, misbehaving lady mm-hmm. is because it is the the name that I put on every female character that I play RPGs on computer games mm-hmm. where I plan to misbehave. Okay. So like the second playthrough on um, pretty much any Fallout game mm-hmm. is is Vixen Fox, the female character who misbehaves. Gotcha. Um, my first one is usually Theophilus and a Paragon, but <laughs> that's irrelevant. <laughs> nice. um, so yeah, uh, um, it was intended that the, the agent, if mm-hmm. you will, mm-hmm. the female agent, um, Agent Fox, mm-hmm. uh, be that... Per- I don't want to say protagonist, but at least voice for good. Yeah. Voice for the opposition. Mm -hmm. Um, The the redeeming character in the end. She's going to believe them. She's going to do all these other things. Yeah. And it ended up not being that way. Mm -hmm. uh, To the point where whenever they got into the morgue Mm -hmm. and they were checking on the dead bodies, I had this moment of inspiration. And I wish I could have confabbed with you in that Mm -hmm. moment. But I didn't. Mm -hmm. And so I improv Mm -hmm. And I went... I need to seriously upgrade the dramatic tension of this situation. Mm. And I realized we have unlimited Jobs. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just going to rewind back to what you call Job Alpha. Yeah. Uh, or or I'm jo- sorry, Job Prime. Job Prime. Yeah. I love that. Um, so I'm just going to rewind, rewind to, to Job Prime. Mm. And uh, that character was created in that instant, but I already had all the information I needed. Mm. Even though he had never been in my thoughts before, mm. um, I knew everything I needed to know about him. Mm-hmm. Because of the situation, because of the world, because of uh, the other Job, mm. I, I just knew it all mm. with one minor change mm-hmm. that he was older. Now, to, um, to detour just for a second, um, speaking of the world um, and of the society and stuff like that, I, I wanted to point out something that I found interesting where... Um, you might have heard in our pre-planning discussion a lot of talk about, um, if you will, sort of making uh, judgments, so to speak, of the society. Yeah, that's right. Um, first figuring out who you are and what you are, and then essentially figuring out what you think of the society you find yourself in. Um, that was part of that newfound AI, de- AI idea that I had that we mentioned very briefly, Yeah. Um, which was essentially that if you had a newborn AI that had no context about anything in the world at all, and basically you're seeing what the world is for the first time through fresh eyes mm-hmm. with no um, no prejudice, no um, sort of like preconceived notions of any sort, right. um, what conclusion would you come to? And that was kind of the idea there. That ended up kind of going by the wayside a little bit, and we, we never really got much of a chance to explore the society. I think some of that was a bit of a time constraint, and the fact that, yeah. as you've mentioned, it turned out we kind of went with a more... Um, people light feel if you will a a sparse population feel and um something that came up um in the uh after action interview we did with the players um which we're probably going to release as a separate little codex um is uh like why the cat suit um which is something that (laughs) it's it's a really cool little detail that i kind of wish was in the series um that uh that we that you had in mind but we didn't get a chance to really play up during play which mm-hmm. was that the society is 
um, rather vain in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah. Um, that uh, the fact that they're allowed to now um, live forever and um, get the perfect body and that sort of stuff. Yeah, they all, all look like Greek gods. Yeah, they're all they're all about showing off and kind of flaunting their style and stuff like that. So uh, we weren't trying to be sexist with the cat suited woman, you know, that sort of thing. We were trying to um, have another example of a character who is basically um, holding themselves in very high esteem and have their own sense of style you yeah, know yeah um and that was um a big part of the society that didn't really get communicated directly in the in the show that's true yeah and and some of the clues to that were um how physical they were whenever they were first born that sort of a thing mm-hmm. the fact that the clerk was a teenager but extremely bored and the mm-hmm. truth is he was you know he was in his 60s himself mm-hmm. you know his mind was and yeah and all these other things that um were just little details that mm-hmm. enriched the world and and weren't they didn't play in directly to the plot, so right. they didn't come up. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it it was something that, as I visualized these things, um, everybody was just ostentatiously dressed in a sort of almost nineteen twenties mm-hmm. flapper mm-hmm. mentality. Yeah, kind of a, a gilded society. In yeah, a sense. yeah. Um, Let's see if there's anything else. So they were all hyper beautiful, in other words. Yeah. Um, let's see. Let's talk about the Kane project because that yeah. that ended up just not happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a great idea. Th- there was something close to it in the conversation with uh, Joe Prime, which was um, basically, and especially with um, Jim's character, um, newest Job, um, kind of offering them whatever it was they wanted. Yeah, a, a fresh start in a sense. Yeah, um, which is. The Kane Project without the new body, effectively. And what's interesting is that that episode title mm-hmm. was something that... We wrote the titles before mm-hmm. uh, any of the episodes. I mean, I had them. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was like one of my very few prompts, is mm-hmm. what is this inspired by, mm-hmm. and what's the title of the episode? And that's something I wanted to mention, too, because it, we didn't include it in our um, our shortened version of the, um, the pre-planning. Mm-hmm. But when we were coming up with the titles, um, we, we mentioned directly within the narrative and in other places that there's a kind of religious overtone right to the society and to the Eden project and, or pre Eden program in general. Um, and so the titles of, uh, including devil and everything, right. The idea is that our characters, um, whether they like it or not, are essentially the devil's advocates. Yeah. If the society is God and what is holy, they're going against it. Right. And so they are the devil. Um, and mm-hmm. so that's why we had all these titles that were basically using uh, old phrases that include a devil in them, like uh, uh, "pregnant with meaning." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, like, which of course was funny because like some of the things that the the meaning of the episode didn't really happen too much in said episode. Like "Devil's Run" was the one where we included the the so called chase, but it was mostly um, Will's interrogation. Um, but he escapes, mm-hmm. so he did in fact run. Yeah, uh, devil take it. Kind of included the thing where they were supposed to go back into the um, into the city and get the information. Yeah, it was the heist. But it was more something that happened like right at the very tail end. It was pretty quick and easy. Yeah. Um, compared to like it being about the heist. Well, and of course of that expression means oh, devil take it. Just yeah. ah, screw it. Yeah. You know, kind yeah. of a kind of a thing. And the last one, deal with the devil. The mm-hmm. question is, which was the devil? Yeah. Were they the devil? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when when old Job made the deal, mm-hmm. was he making the deal with the devil, or was he making the deal? And because of that, he was the devil. Yeah, and it's or it's, the, the players are still the devils against this uh, this high society, right. you know. So exactly right. So it was ambiguous on purpose. Yeah. and I, I think I really enjoy those types of titles that mm-hmm. don't give it away, but have have lots of well, pregnant with meaning. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going to stick with that phrase. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, stuff got pushed to the wayside, like the idea of the, the Kane Project and, and some of the other things, like the idea of Agent Fox, who um, ended up not even being a main character at all. She just got downgraded at the last moment, and, mm-hmm. and a new one was invented. Um, but overall, I think that uh, the themes that we wanted came through. Mm-hmm. I think the story we wanted to tell came through. Yeah, and um, I think in a way, each of the players kind of played up their own themes um they did which was really cool um like jim really played up the sort of freedom of information theme yeah um uh will to a greater extent than the others played up the um sort of the themes that like we had sort of embedded about um like what is a soul and is this murder and that sort of stuff because he was kind of like the voice of reason so to speak when they talked them out of you know just transporting themselves yeah um and, and Freddie was interesting because he was 
in a way, kind of like the character who was looking for meaning and couldn't find it. Yeah. Um, and uh, talk about living in the shadow of your former self. Yeah. I mean, my goodness. And he was complaining constantly about, like, I didn't get a message or anything. So, like, really, he was left without any sort of sense of, like, who he was or supposed to be. He yeah. just knew he was a rock star and that he was rich. Yeah. Um, and, but, but that's okay, because he'll rock in the stars now yeah. forever. <laughs> and, uh, and then, of course, um, you know, he did get a little bit of fulfillment there, I think, when um, Joe Prime was telling him about, like, how he used to love his music and that sort of thing. That's true, yeah. But even then, it's not, it wasn't him, you know? Yeah. So. I tell you. Well, we had a lot of fun doing this season and um super super excited to say that season two is uh well has already started Mm -hmm. and so we're um very very thankful to will Mm -hmm. parsons who of course played jefferson Mm -hmm. uh for actually gming this one so that we could play (laughs) and um moving forward we hope that there'll be many 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 seasons of roll with it and um very much like talking about the meta behind it and the things that go on in our decisions and our design process in that. So, mm. um, and it's the interesting thing about um, improvised stories in this way that when you have a, and I don't know if we technically qualify as actual play. I think we do, but I'm not sure if the amount of production we put um, into the post, the post production. I think it's a fair trade. Yeah, um, but I think that the fact that it, we did actually play the game and we didn't really like. We didn't edit the actual content. No, we, we, didn't. we, we trimmed a few things out, but it was like extraneous things we didn't need yeah. just to keep it flowing we didn't, nicely. We didn't do anything in post or mm-hmm. we, we didn't like pickups. change what happened or anything like right. that. Um, and every, we didn't railroad. Yeah, everything you heard was just what happened live. So in a sense, uh, you know, I, I think the story turned out pretty well, all things being said. But it might not have had the same sort of polish and impact that a pre-written sort of like. We, we didn't, like, write a movie and revise right. a script over and over again. It was, we came in with a concept, we let the players take it where they would, um, and we think it was fairly successful overall. Um, so, you know, hopefully you guys enjoyed it, too. Yeah, I hope um, that authenticity came through, because yeah. that's what we were really going and for. That, that's, that's kind of the thing, is, like, even it, it, what we might lack in kind of, like, literary... Tightness? Help. Yeah. Um, hopefully we make up for in... Just the fact that we had a really cool story come out of something that was improvised. You're here. So. All right. Looking forward to number two. Yep. And number three and number four. (laughs) And so on. So thanks for listening, everybody. And uh, hopefully you uh, got something out of us basically um, geeking out about our design process. And uh, like, especially you heard in the pre-planning, the uh, kind of like the lit nerds coming out and talking about things like story structure and whatnot. That's right. So uh, if you've sat through all this, you're probably the type who also thinks that's cool. So we appreciate you guys listening. Very much. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. Yep. Uh, until uh, next time, uh, stay compatible. <laughs>